especially a lot of people in my generation, just to say, you know what, if you know he can do it, if Barack Obama can do it, I can do it. And I think it inspired a whole generation of new people who want to take leadership roles, mm -hmm. um, and not only just in leadership roles of you know working in education, but leadership roles in policies and governance. You know, the age group between of 18 and 34 is one of the lowest turnout population groups in voting. And so we can change that, you know what I'm saying? I can tell you how many people, when I decided to run for city council, is to get more people engaged, get our youth engaged in what goes on, and understand what politics are local. Because a lot of people were so engaged in the presidential election, but don't realize that the local politics are the ones that are going to affect your day-to-day -day life. You know, things that are voted on in city council or in county commission go right in effect the next day. Whereas anything that's voted in Congress or anything like that, of course it's got to go through the House, through the Senate, then the President, and all that other stuff, and then it still might not trickle down for years to come. Mm -hmm. So um, the education was one reason uh, I was excited to run and put myself out there and, and really educate people in my age range, but also just get a fresh new face. Um, because I feel, really feel like people complain about our generations not stepping up the leadership. Now we're stepping up. So now we have that torch has to be passed on. And we're asking our elders to mentor us, to work with us, um, to truly pass that torch and make sure that we're doing the right things and make sure that we keep that, that flame burning. Or as the torch bearer here is, keeps that torch lit and stuff like that. So I was very excited to run. I had a great campaign. I know I didn't win, but at the same time, it really changed the face of politics, I think, personally, um, in the city of Knoxville. For some fact, you had a first-time African-American candidate that wasn't running out of African-American district. So that was very unique. Um, the, I, that was actually the second question I always got running was, okay, why are you running? How does it feel to run being an African American male in a predominantly white district? Because normally people could, would consider African American male or an African American running in a predominantly African American district. And I say, well, I think politics has changed because you elected Barack Obama. I didn't elect Barack Obama. No minority population truly elected him if you really think about it. You know, I'm saying when he won the majority of the votes, it wasn't because of the minority population, it's because of the majority population. So if you're able to do that, I said, why wouldn't you be able to elect me as your city councilman? And I, at the end of the day, Barack represents all, whether it's Democrats, Republicans, he represents all Americans. And at the day, end of the day, that's how I looked at it. I would represent all Knox Villians. So that's the biggest thing. And I think it really shook up a lot of people. I know I had a lot of people jumping on the campaign, a lot of young people wanted to be involved. Um, it was a very diverse campaign. Um, I knocked on a lot of doors, <clears throat> met a lot of great people, built some great friendships and partnerships out of it. So I wouldn't take it uh, away from the world. Now everybody keeps kind of you know nudging me like, are you going to run again? Are you going to run again? And I keep telling people, I'm going to lay low and be quiet. And uh, we'll see because it's not to 2011, the next city council races. Um, and what's key with that race is you draw have a mayoral race, so more people will be paying attention then too. So I'm gonna sit back and see and see, you know, how the constituents fail, knock on some doors, talk to some more people and see who's willing to back me and push me maybe at a for an at large bid. Sounds exciting. Oh, yeah. You do this and you're involved in <laughs> the YouTube community. Mm -hmm. I know you mentioned the Black Issues Conference. Yes, that my is baby. Your brain that child. is my baby. I'm a, I'm gonna claim child. that bad boy. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, start like I said, there. when I first came here to the university, I noticed that we were just lacking just in certain programs, certain educational programs, and we were also lacking in the number of students involved in the programs. The thing with the Black Issues Conference, my thing was, let's create something for students by students, the old FUBU model, and, and where students would do the presentations, they would run the conference, the whole nine. Now, a lot of people don't know that there's a Texas A&M, I think it is, that does... Um, a large black uh, student pop, uh, conference as well. And it's run just by students, you know what I'm saying? The whole nine, they bring in the speaker, but the students run it uh, with some guidance from the administration and the whole nine. And see, that's what I envision here because I feel students need to take ownership of the discussions that we need to take place here on campus. And, and it was very much myself and two students who started it. Um, <clears throat> Erica Watson was one of the students and was another gentleman uh, I can't remember his name off because he was this there that year and he graduated. But it was an idea. We were just sitting around like talking, and I was like, "Well, I got an idea. What do you guys think about it?" And I'm like, "I like that idea." And we went out to I took him out to dinner one night, and we started talking more about it. And I was like, "We're gonna do it." So then I presented it to our staff, and our staff was like, "Okay." They didn't know what it looked like. I knew what it looked like because I just in my mind I knew what it looked like. And so first year, 170 students show up. We had AC Wharton as our keynote speaker. Um, Raised five thousand dollars to put it on. I mean, so 
it was phenomenal for a first time thing. Now it's probably become the biggest conference on campus. Um, and not only that, because I know that for a fact, because we're getting UTC students, Tennessee Tech students, Maryville College, Carson Newman students, all are starting to come to the event. Um, and what I envisioned it when we started that it is in five to ten years, it's a state conference. Where, you know, you actually do it for a weekend and we, we focus on different things and really get everybody engaged. But it was that, it was other programs that I know we needed here, it's things we needed to strengthen with some of our programs. Because it's one thing to throw a bunch of programs when we bring a bunch of speakers. Here. I think that's that's good. Don't get me wrong, but if speakers, we can't touch those speakers. If you can't sit down and like and have a conversation with me, what's the true impact? Are we just pe bringing people in here for their names and saying, "Oh, guess what? We had Cornell West, well, uh, um, or you know, Harry Belafonte, all these people who we want our students to know about these generation and these people." But at the same time, we got to be able to have them be able to be touched because that's my biggest thing. Um, some of the greatest speakers are the ones who actually will sit down with you, like when we had Randall for our, our third Black Issues mm -hmm. Conference. Randall sat there at lunch talking to students and interacting. And, you know, when you have that kind of speaker and that kind of individual, that's so important to students. I mean, Randall Pinkett, like, shared information. He, I don't know, one of the students got his contact information. Was, he's been helping him with something. That is the key. And so when you look at some of the things that were going on in the office, I really felt we needed to educate our students and be able to have our students not only lead where we were going and give us advice on some of the stuff, but also at the same time work with us on making sure that they left here with a broad, like I said, with an exposed education as a key. And so the Black Issues Conference was great. Uh, we strengthened the Minority Achievement Program, the mentoring program there in the office. Um, created the Mahogany Soul Cafe because I really was surprised we didn't have anything for our artistic students here. We have a lot of great students here who are artistic. so. Um, it's just one of those things. And so a lot of the programs, I'm not there anymore, but if you look at a lot of those programs that are still in the office, uh, they were all programs that were started by myself and our grad student when we were there. So, And they're, they're, they're constant programs that will have to be, you know, retooled and all the other great stuff, but they're strong programs. And I really think that that's the biggest thing. we got to make sure that our students are having the right proper tools to matriculate towards graduation, get the experience they need, and make sure that when they leave here, they're able to come back and say, well, if it was for X, Y, and Z, why I was able to succeed? And then it should be like a threefold type thing. You know, they, they come in the door, mm -hmm. they learn a lot while they're here, they graduate, and they're able to give back, whether it's time and money. Okay. Do you have any party words for the UT students? I would say get to know all the Black Falcon staff on campus. It's very <laughs> important. Before the simple fact, um, they're, they're all over. That's the shocking part. You know, we walk past each other, and I get it all the time because people think I'm a student sometimes. I walk in somewhere, somebody's like, oh, are you a student? I'm like, no, <laughs> even in this building. Um, we need to have some kind of event where our Black Falcon staff meet with our students, let them know that we're here as a support system. Uh, we need our students to start asking the questions and putting pressure on the things that need to be in place for them. You know, we need to have more of our students advocate for different things and not always be at the party. <laughs> Uh, we need more of our students uh, who go on to graduate to come back, you know, at a couple years, two or three years out, and talk about what it's like to be in the real world, what you experience here, and give back. And the old, you know, each one reach one. So, you know, go back and reach one and help somebody else. So we need students that matriculate on, graduate, come back and help the next person um, because that's how we're going to get stronger as an institution. There's be no reason, I feel, personally feel, that any predominantly white institution that has uh, a multicultural development office or multicultural affairs or minority student affairs office should not have some kind of model system where students come in, graduate, and, and come back. And that it's like a family atmosphere, no matter if you graduated in 1999 or 2009, but you shared some kind of experience while here at the University of Tennessee that you create a network that grows like this. And like I said, you're the first graduates from the 60s should be able to come back and say, well, yeah, this is what it was like here when I graduated. Talk to the graduating class of 2010. And that they build that network where you say, if I'm an African-American student and graduate from University of Tennessee, our network is like this. And that your experience, you know, back in the day might have been not great, but now it is. How can we make that experience even better? Thank you, Tierney. Mm -hmm. And this is another Not In Class interview. Not In Class. Go there. <laughs>